Have you ever thought to yourself what kind of terrible thing it would be to be paralyzed? Even just from the waist down, how horrible. Ever get into an accident and wondered what if? To be disabled is uh, one of those things that we greatly fear. And anyone who's had a broken bone, even though he knows it's only temp temporary, he understands how terribly difficult it is. To be reliant on others for all our needs, or most of our needs, these things bother us. Think about Christopher Reeve, how, how he managed after his terrible accident, being thrown from a horse, he became a quadriplegic. He couldn't move anything but his head. Here's this big strapping actor who actually played Superman in the movies, reduced to using his cheek to operate a joystick and get around. And he had money. Didn't help though, did it? We see Johnny Erickson Tata as another example, right? Someone, we kind of look at her as, as a hero of the faith because she just keeps plugging along nevertheless. But does she have a choice? You know, early in her injury, she tells of a time of temptation where she thought about suicide. It's hard to be disabled. Blindness is something that a lot of people fear because even if physically capable, participation in anything is almost completely impossible. To be blind renders all other features relatively useless. Think about Samson, who as strong as he was, when he had his hair cut, he was, his eyes were put out and he was reduced to being a court fool. In the Bible, these physical maladies are used as a picture of our spiritual malady, sin. If you take your Bibles and open up to chapter uh, 10 of Mark, chapter 10 of Mark, Jesus transforms blind, destitute sinners who come to him in faith. What does true faith really look like? And given Christ's demonstration of love, how should we live? Those are the things I'm going to try and answer as we look at this passage. Mark 10, go to verse 46. We're going to read six verses from 46 to 52. I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. Follow along in your translation. Uh, yeah, maybe it won't work. That's all right. Oh, up to the, the verses, brother. There we are. I don't know why it's not going. Same problem as our brother Ben. This is the word of God. Then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him here. And so he called the blind man and saying to him, Take courage. Get up. He's calling for you. And throwing off his outer garment, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered him and said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has saved you. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. Let's set the stage here. Recall, if you will, that Jesus is moving rapidly towards Jerusalem. The time has come for the demonstration of his love on the cross. And if you uh, remember our last message, which was way back in May, in Mark 10, 32, it tells us that Jesus was walking on ahead of them so fast that they were amazed. He was purposeful. He had to get there. He's got an appointment to keep. 
And here, as he approaches the city of Jericho, all three synoptics tell us of the healing that he performs here. Jericho is situated eight miles northwest of where the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. It's 16 more miles to Jerusalem. However, on arriving in Jericho, one leaves the plain of Jordan and begins to steadily climb for 16 miles. Jericho is 864 feet below sea level, and Jerusalem is 2,575 feet above sea level. Almost two-thirds of a mile over 16 miles. He's going to march, so to speak, right? He's on a schedule, yet he's leaving this city, and he stops for a blind beggar. So who is this beggar? If you read the text, you might come away with the idea that the beggar's name is Bartimaeus. That's almost certainly not the case. We've got a number of uh, references to bar something. Listen to these names and, and uh, interpretations. Mark 3.18, we have Bartholomew, the son of Talmai. Um, in Matthew 16.17, we have Bar-Jonah, the son of Jonah. In Acts 4.36, we have Barnabas, the son of encouragement. We, we just typically say Barnabas, right? And then we have, of course, Barabbas, who's the man who was released in place of Christ. The son of the father, that's what that means, the son of the father. And then there's, of course, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Bar is the Aramaic for son. The word for son in the Greek is huios. So Mark actually just tells us the son of Timaeus, Bartimaeus. That's how he puts it. If you look in the two parallel accounts, you'll find that there's no personal name for him. So I'll refer to him as Bartimaeus, but he's kind of an anonymous figure. Lastly, the two parallel accounts do give us some unique information. Matthew mentions that there were actually two blind men. Mark is just focusing on the, the, the one. He also informs us that Jesus was moved with compassion upon their request for healing. And isn't that just like Jesus? Luke adds that the blind man glorified God, giving the rowdy crowd a reason to praise God also. You might remember this crowd. We've encountered this crowd all along as we've been going through the book of Mark. Um, We've got the, the large crowd at the feeding of the 5,000, and uh, they're, they're, they're finicky. They're a difficult crowd. But they're, they're, this is the same retinue that Jesus has with him. Sure, there are some true disciples among them, but many are just following for other reasons. And this is the last, almost the last miracle recorded in Jesus' ministry. We only have two left in the book of Mark, Four in total, okay? You got causing a fig tree to die, uh, to die in Mark 11, healing Malchus's ear in Luke uh, 22, and the resurrection, which is, of course, in all, and then in the book of John, causing a big catch of fish in John chapter 21. So really, the ministry of his healing is largely coming to a close. But we have many things to learn on this one. Jesus is performing his miracle on the heels of James and John's somewhat improper request of authority in the kingdom. So let's consider what we learn in this account. I have three main points, and then we're going to look at uh, another similar account in the book of John. So this is point number one, the sinner before salvation. He's blind. Those, now, when we think about this, what do we know about this blind man when we look at these verses? The blind man knew about Jesus. The text tells us that he was informed that Jesus the Nazarene, or Jesus of Nazareth, depending on your translation, was passing by. But you notice what does he say? He does not immediately cry out, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. This blind beggar may not have had physical sight, but he had a certain spiritual eyesight, didn't he? It's no accident that we learn the particulars of what Bartimaeus heard and what he said. 
we know something about what he knew. Now, some of you know about Jesus. A lot of you know a lot of things about Jesus. You've grown up in the church. And even if you were saved as an adult, you've been in the church for many years perhaps, right? And what, what do we know about him? Well, certainly he was a great healer and a good teacher, right? But you also know that he claimed to be deity, God in the flesh, the very son of God himself. Now, have you trusted your life to his holy life? Have you made that exchange, your wretched life, for his holy one? That's what this blind man does. That's what we'll be seeing as we go through this. This is an exercise in what salvation looks like. Secondly, the blind man knew himself aright. He knew who Jesus was and he knew who he was. Notice his request, son of David, have mercy. You know, people do not ask for mercy when they are doing well, do they? We don't cry out for mercy when we feel deserving of help. He could have cried out, Jesus, son of David, help me. I'm blind. But he doesn't do that, does he? He says, have mercy. And that cry of mercy betrays that he knew he was wretched, apart from his blindness. How do you look at yourself? How do you consider the kind of person you are? Do you think, I'm, I'm basically good? Or do you think, oh, I'm better off today than I was, say, 15 years ago? Or if you're a kid, say, five years ago, right? Do you think like that? Why? Have things changed? Well, I'm not walking in rebellion anymore. Or, well, I've, I've matured. Does that really mean that you're different? Are you a different person than who you were? If you think like that, I urge you to reconsider. Apart from the mercy of God in Christ, you and I are hopeless, helpless, and destined for hell. And it doesn't matter that we live better, more responsible lives today. That's a good thing. It's a good thing that we live better, responsible lives, right? that does not seal the deal with God. Only Christ can heal the sickness of our sin. Let's look at just a few verses regarding our condition before Christ. We've got Job 25, verse 4. How then can a man be just with God? Or how can he be clean who is born of woman? That's just to say that there is no man who can be just before God. As we are, we're wretched. And there is no justice to be found with God. As we are. Isaiah 6, 5. Isaiah, this is in Isaiah's call to the ministry. He is brought in a vision into the throne room of God and immediately he realizes he's doomed. Verse 5 says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Some translations say, I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So if you think that somehow, that well, I'm living better today, that when that day comes that you are ushered before the king, that you'll be able to stand? No. no. Isaiah 53, 6. Now, Isaiah 53 is one of those chapters that is so beautiful to those who do love the Lord, who have made the exchange. But listen to his explanation or his, his reference here in verse 6. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has called the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Hmm. Maybe there's hope to be found here, right? Jeremiah 17, 9. Another somewhat familiar verse. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. 
Who can understand it? Okay, so here we are. We, we say we're going to try and live better lives. And we examine ourselves. But how are you going to examine your heart if the very tool that you use to examine yourself is corrupt and desperately sick? Dead even in some, some ways you could say. What hope do you have of finding the fault? Even if you could rectify it. That's how bad things are, folks. Before Christ, we were doomed. And listen to how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So there you have a picture of what we are apart from Christ. There is no way outside of Christ. My second point is the sinner seeking salvation. And you'll see this in verses 47 through 51. The sinner seeking salvation. This is one of my larger points. There's a lot of material here to consider. I want you to think about what it is to come to Christ. What does it really mean? What does it look like? How, does it, how is it accomplished? That's what we're going to see here. Remember, Jesus transforms blind, destitute sinners who come to him in faith. First of all, we are people of poverty. And I think I've just shown that to you, haven't I? How can such poor beggars as we are approach the mercy seat of God? Think about what it might be to be permitted to, per, to uh, visit Queen Elizabeth. Now, we're Americans. We don't think of the queen as our ruler. Even in Britain, they don't really, all that, except for in a, a majestic sort of way. I don't know. That, but you can't just walk into the throne room of Queen Elizabeth. Do you even know how to arrange the meeting? How would you contact her or her people? She's pretty far removed, isn't she? And what if you, by some you know, uh, way, received that invitation? How would you prepare yourself? Would you even know what to wear? What would you plan to say? Well, you say, that's ridiculous on its face. I would never be invited to see the queen. Maybe some of you say, oh, I wouldn't care. But this is the queen of a sovereign nation. And if uh, the queen of a sovereign nation is hard for us to approach, how about the God of the universe? Majestic, high, and holy. In his throne room. We'll be just like Isaiah. Invited, but unprepared. Right? Right? Why, why is this so difficult? Because poverty cannot approach royalty. Sinful man cannot approach holy God. Not by ourselves. In our day, though, we've seen quite routinely that a common person might be able to sit and speak with the queen, but it's not random chance or, or uh, something. You can't just sit on the curb in London outside the palace if that's where it's at, you know, and, and expect to be able to, you know, be invited in. Nope. In fact, you should do that and you might get carried off to jail for vagrancy. Commoners who do visit the queen have to be briefed on all the rules of protocol. They have to be prepared. They are made ready. But how will we get ready? For the king. How do we justify our sin riddled lives before the king of kings? You know, on our own account, it's impossible. But we can do so by faith. 
Remember, Bartimaeus was not ignorant of Christ. He called him by his messianic title. He didn't say Jesus of Nazareth. He said Jesus, son of David. Why? Because David's son is the king. And the king has means. Nevertheless, he called out loudly and with no regard for protocol. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. They tried to shut him up. And the minute you try to call out for, to, to, to God for help in your time of need, the world will quench you. They will stomp you. They will push you down. Don't let that happen. Be like Bartimaeus, who cried out again and again and again, Son of David, have mercy. This man's faith made him leap up, throw aside his coat, and run blindly through this rowdy crowd to find Jesus. And several years ago, I preached on faith, on the faith of Abraham, and at that time, I defined faith as a disposition. That is to say, um, towards or against God. It might be better stated that faith is confidence or trust, which is built upon the disposition toward God that one has when his heart is made new. Let me say that again. Faith is confidence or trust, which is built upon the disposition toward God that one has when his heart is made new. And that's exactly what Lloyd-Jones says. Here's, here's his statement. So when the scriptures talk about giving us a new heart or a clean heart, they're talking about what I have described as the fundamental disposition, the thing that controls or determines everything else. So this blind man was disposed to look upon Jesus for who he was actually and not who he might have appeared to be. We've got this rowdy crowd and they're there for other reasons. You remember a few uh, months back we had Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration and he was revealed to three of his disciples as to who he was. But most people didn't see Jesus for who he was. They saw him as just a man. In fact, think about this. Who did Jesus look to be like by the faithless? Well, you might say the illegitimate child of a poor family in Nazareth, an unlearned carpenter, a common tradesman, a man living in the backwaters of Jewish settlements, Nazareth, where all the crazy devil-possessed people lived, as well as a great deal of Gentiles, and next door to Samaria. Well, let's go see what this guy can do for me. He might entertain us for a little while, right? That's what some of the people in the crowd thought of Jesus. But to this blind man, he knew better. He didn't let his poverty keep him from Christ. His disposition was toward Jesus as Messiah. His faith was demonstrated in a Messiah with whom he had hope and trust. To put it another way, his confidence in Christ. His confidence was in Christ. How do you look upon Jesus? Where is your faith in regards to this? Now, you know, our modern age is filled with quite a few conveniences. We get our information from the information highway. We don't need books. We've got computers. We don't really need anyone. We've got cell phones. And they can keep us in touch with every important event in the modern world. And guess what? We've isolated ourselves. We think to ourselves, how could Jesus care about my difficulties? He's high and seated above in a throne. And he hasn't been here in two millennia. We begin to think of him more as being a distant, uninterested God. And who dare approach him? 
But it isn't any wonder why our prayers often go unanswered when we come to Him with a disposition like that. Do you see how quickly we become men and women of faithless minds and hearts? We can be people who profess faith in Him but don't actually cast our concerns upon Him. We don't believe it. People, you need to believe it. This book is real. Jesus stopped when he heard the blind man cry out for mercy. He didn't have to do so. This blind man was a beggar. He was poor and he had nothing to recommend him. And the crowd certainly tried to prevent him from making a scene. He was that bad. I mean, you think of a beggar. We see them sometimes in Woodstock, unkempt. Sometimes they sleep in terrible places. Sometimes they do. We don't want to be a part of that, do we? Yeah, so the crowd is like that. And this is that crowd, you know. They're looking for another free lunch. Or maybe they'll see an exorcism. They really didn't have any grasp of Christ's mission. Even the 12 really didn't get that. So when he cries out, Son of David, have mercy, they try to put him down. Oh, this is terrible. We've got, we've got a party going on over here. Now think about this mission of Christ. He's just beginning to climb the last 16 miles to the metropolis of Jerusalem where this beggar wouldn't be welcomed. And Christ would be falsely welcomed in triumph and four days later be killed on a planned schedule that three days afterwards would explode the ancient world when he rose from the dead. You realize we're literally one week from the risen Christ as we read through the book of Mark? One week. And yet, Jesus stopped for him. Why would he not stop for you when the car won't start? As trivial as that is, why do we think that Jesus does not care when our troubles cause us trials? Why do we think that the King of Heaven who went to the cross for us doesn't care. We need to be reminded while he is truly a king, seated on a regal throne in great splendor, he does care. He does stop for his people. And he stops for those who cry out to him in faith. We must be reminded of his tenderness, lest we become like that rowdy, unruly crowd who tried to shut the blind man down. And we do that sometimes. We don't want to be bothered by people like that. That's not Christ-like, folks. But let's consider some verses here which show that God is ready to hear the cry of anyone who would trust him. Start with what is arguably one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. The Apostle Paul says this of himself in 1 Timothy 1, 16. Yet for this reason I found mercy. So that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And remember, Paul called himself the chief of sinners, and in many respects he was. He murdered people and put them in jail for believing in the Christ. And all the sins that we could possibly imagine, I wouldn't want that one to my account and then have to come and stand before Christ. 
and yet he showed Paul patience. What does this teach us about Christ? Jesus did stop for an insignificant blind beggar of a man. Consider Psalm 34. I'm just going to read a f uh, three verses, verses 15 through 18. I wish, uh, yeah, it's up on the screen. Great. The eyes of Yahweh are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of Yahweh is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and Yahweh hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Yahweh is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Now this might seem like a challenging passage to, to consider. How do we apply that or how do we consider that in light of what we've been discussing? Think about this. It says here, the face of Yahweh is against the evildoers. We are the evildoers. Whoa. All over the scriptures, plainly call all people wicked, fallen sinners. We have all sinned by commission, doing what we ought not, and by omission, neglecting what we should do. Yet the Lord hears and delivers the wicked by the application of the suffering death and perfect life of Christ. Broken-hearted people, sinful people, are heard by the Lord when they cry out for mercy in faith. That is the grace of God. As we wrap up, I want to call attention to verse 51. And Jesus answered him and said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to re regain my sight. Bartimaeus asked for restored eyesight. You must call upon the Lord for salvation. Trust Christ. He is the only healer of your soul. Third point is the sinner after salvation, a new creation. And we see this in verse 52 of our passage. We've got four points here briefly to look at. Bartimaeus was no longer blind. Blindness is one of those maladies that we who have sight especially abhor. We've already went through that, right? Think about the saying, seeing is believing. Well, there's some truth to that. The fact is, we've all seen football replays where one camera's vision is, shows the play so convincingly and then another vantage point reveals a very different story, right? Well, that's what it's like, physical vision. Sometimes we can be tricked. Our eyes in this world can fool us. Physical sight is really just a foreshadowing of spiritual sight. Yeah, Bartimaeus' eyes were opened, but so was his heart made new. What else? Well, he was now following Christ. Whereas he, Christ is on the road, he, he's following him down in the, in the retinue, and this is a really interesting thought. One commentator mentioned that at the beginning of this count, he was sidelined, begging as an outcast on the side of the road. And now he's on the road in the very retinue of the king. As a blind man, he could follow no one. But now that he can see, he follows Christ. He was no longer a beggar. His lot in life might not have appeared to change much. He wasn't wearing the outer cloak he had before, but he was no lo but he, 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 he had the experience of a lifetime. He had met the king. He now knows the king. And this is really where the rubber meets the road, folks. We all know Christians whose testimony is real and true. There, there can be no question about their faith in Christ, and yet they remain poor in this life. They have great difficulties. They might have physical maladies that haven't been healed. Think of Johnny, a woman who's done much good. And yet the pain she struggles with, and she tells some of those struggles. I'm sure some of you have listened to her 
give testimony or possibly have read the book. If you haven't, you should. Johnny Erickson Tata. But there's plenty of other people like her. The, the, the problem we have here is this apparent contradiction is that while we live here in this world, we are not yet home. We are travelers, sojourning in a land that is not ours. We used to live in this land as citizens, but now that we follow the king of heaven, we are citizens of heaven. We have yet to arrive in the promised land, but we will. Today we're ambassadors for Christ, and an ambassador lives in a foreign nation. Don't look for God's kingdom here in that way. Christ stated, my kingdom is not of this world. Our salvation is just a taste of the glories to come. Finally, all this happened immediately. When faith is present and you cry out to God, hope is restored. Those who've been delivered from sin immediately begin to change. They don't, change, they don't become perfectly holy in an instant, but they do begin the trek of holy living. As a man is sanctified, he finds a greater desire to honor the Lord in his holy life. Sometimes he'll fall. But the scripture says a righteous man falls seven times and gets up again. And that doesn't mean he doesn't, that he falls the eighth time and doesn't. Seven times is emblematic of he never quits seeking to honor God when he falls. I'd like to look at a parallel miracle in John chapter 9. It's the case of a man born blind in John's gospel. Now, this actually occurred in Jesus' ministry probably eight or nine months before Bartimaeus' healing, okay? Just as a, a point of reference, because this stuff is all history, folks. It's not just theology, but it's theology rooted in history, which is what makes our faith so valid and real. The world might try to attack the scriptures, but it's very hard to actually attack. That's why it's still here with us. If it was easy to discount the Bible, it would have been discounted millennia ago. So this parallel miracle is in John chapter 9. We're not going to look at every verse, but we will consider the account and learn from it how faith is shown and what this effect had on the community and the man himself. Let me give you, uh, let me start by reading the first couple of verses. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this was so that the works of God might be manifested in him. Now I want you to notice that the purpose of the man's blindness and subsequent healing is explicitly stated by Christ that the works of God might be shown in him. That's the reason he was born blind. That's really important. There may be many things that have troubled you in your life. There's not one of them that is not there for God's purpose. Not one. The fact that the Lord loves to heal sinners who come to him by faith does not imply that our well-being physically is the only reason he heals. God will be glorified in all that he does. And if he puts you in a difficult circumstance, he will be glorified in it, or he would not put that there. God's glory is the, is the, the end of it all. Christ heals him by making clay and putting it on his eyes and having him wash in the pool of Siloam. Now we'll go to verse 8. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, This is he. And still others are saying, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the one. Notice the similarity between this man and Bartimaeus. 
Not only were they both blind, they were both beggars. That's what we are spiritually, folks. Blind, beggars, with dead hearts, we're deaf, we can't read, we don't understand. Apart from Christ, that's where we are. Let's go to verse 16. So then, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a sinful man do such signs? And there was a division among them. Okay, Christ's healing of this man caused a great controversy among the Jews and the, the, the authorities. Jesus healed this man on a Sabbath, which meant they saw him as a lawbreaker. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. God rested after creation, and we're supposed to reflect him in this as we are made in his image. There's nothing wrong with that theology. Yet, the act of healing, especially restoring sight to a blind man, was not a breaking of the Sabbath. You see, remember in Mark chapter 3, we, we studied and the, the Lord healed a man with a withered hand. And he did so on the Sabbath, but he even did it in the synagogue as a, a point to teach. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they, they kept silent. See, the Jews had made up a whole litany of rules to be sure that they kept the Sabbath. And one of those rules had to do with medicinal matters. If a matter of life and death, if it was a matter of life and death, it's permitted. But blindness, withered hands, that could wait. Now these seems like seem like reasonable things, right? To you, you might say, I I would stand on that sort of a premise, so that I can keep the Sabbath. But putting those personal rules as additional barriers, no, we don't do that. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. That does not mean don't heal on the Sabbath. It does not mean a lot of things that we sometimes think it means. This man's healing caused a great, such a dilemma because it was notable and the people were beginning to praise God over it, which called into question those Pharisaical rules about Sabbath keeping. For a time, the Jews wouldn't even believe this was a true healing. So they called the man's parents in to testify. Verses 19 to 20, 21, listen. Is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? So his parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. And who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. Now they had a real issue to deal with because they couldn't ignore this and say, ah, oh, well, it didn't really happen. Ah, oh, it's just a made-up thing. No, there was, this is a valid testimony. It's certain. They've got to now deal with this. So, verse 24. Therefore, a second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Notice the reference that the Pharisees give to God's glory. The healing of a man's blindness plainly does glorify God, and Christ explicitly stated that that was his purpose in healing this man, yet they see the matter in entirely different terms. They see Christ as the sinner. Beloved, how can this be? Because these Jewish authorities themselves were blind. They were the blind leading the blind, Matthew 15, 14. They continue to argue with the no longer blind man in verse 29. Listen to this. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. So the man answered and said to them, well, here's a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, and he opened my eyes. 
We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does His will, He listens to Him. Since the beginning of time, it has not been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Did you, did you notice the logical reasoning of this formerly blind man? Verse 31 uses the same reasoning I used earlier with regard to Psalm 34. Broken-hearted, sinful people are heard by the Lord when they cry out for mercy. That's the grace of God. Here's a man who is destitute as a blind beggar and healed both of physical blindness as well as spiritual blindness. And verse 34 is really striking. They answered and said to him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? So they put him out. He was no longer blind, and as a result, he was teaching them. <laughs> That happens, folks. When you come to know the Lord, you will begin to tell people about the Lord. Genuine salvation is often accompanied by hardship, though. They put him out. What that meant was he could no longer go to synagogue. They set him apart. A kind of an excommunication of sorts. That would be a hard thing if you were kicked out of church and you were not involved in sin where do you go what do you do it's another reminder that we are no longer citizens of this world when we come to Christ verse 35 Jesus heard that they had put him out and after finding him he said do you believe in the son of man and he answered and said who is he Lord that I may believe in him Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. It's interesting that this man's healing was different from that of Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus simply comes and says, Lord, that I might see. And immediately he was able to see. But this man was, was, had clay put on his eyes. Jesus spits on the ground, makes a little bit of mud or clay, puts it on his eyes, and says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he does it. But did you ever, you know, wonder about those kind of things? Two or three different, you know, we, we find multiple ways that God heals people. And, and if you ever listen to the stories of salvation or read books about how people were saved, there's, there's an endless variety of them. People are saved in childhood with what might seem like small sins. Some are saved as adults with notorious lifestyles and sins. We see people saved from every social position, rich or poor, men, women, children, all ethnicities, Jew and Gentile, right? I bet you didn't know that even ministers, preachers have been saved while in the pulpit. There's a very notorious uh, account of William Haslam, Pastor William Haslam, who was an ordained minister with the Church of England in the 1800s, and while preaching a message, suddenly it dawned on him, the gospel, and he begins to praise God and stop preaching because he realized and then was saved. And he is not alone. There are other people who, you know, in, in certain days, not our day, our day typically people, at least within our uh, family, if you want to say a Baptist, we, we consider you have to be a, a, a saved man and we, we, we examine men, right? But in the older days, sometimes they would say, well, if you understand the doctrine and you can, and you can preach a good message, God can use the message anyway, and they would allow people who actually said they weren't believers to be a pastor, which sounds ridiculous to our ears. But there have been many testimonies of people coming to know the Lord in that way. <laughs> That's the power of God. Notice the response. He worshipped Christ. 
This is always the response of genuine faith and trust in Christ. We follow him. We worship him, no matter the cost. And we do so because we know that God is for us. Let's look at the last few verses of John's account. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, Are we blind too? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. What Christ is getting at here is spiritual pride will blind. The very persons or people who ought to have humbled themselves knowing God's word as well as they did would not and therefore remain blind. And brothers and sisters, while that applies to those who do not know the Lord, some of us who know the Lord can become spiritually proud anyway Keep guard. Watch out that you don't become spiritually proud. Pride is a blinder. We don't see ourselves rightly and therefore we don't appreciate our need for a savior. But those who recognize their own blindness, their inability to do anything to heal themselves are far more prepared to trust in the one who can restore sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf and life to the dead. For application, I've got two things. One, it's primarily for those who know the Lord. See, Jesus' miracles are purposeful. They are not only a blessing to us who are healed, but to those around us who have hope in God, seeing the work, His works in this world. Right? Luke's account of Bartimaeus completes with the following statement. This is Luke's account. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave glory to God. When we begin to walk faithfully with our God, God is glorified not only by us, but by those around us who say, Whoa, that person used to be, but look at him now. As believers, we are to live for God's glory, which means that as we are identified with Christ, we reflect him to a watching world, whether for good or bad. We must live for Christ. Remembering that he who went to the cross on our behalf is owed our total allegiance. We should walk in the Spirit, which is to say that the fruit of the Spirit should be our goal. I'll read that verse. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, we let us also walk in step with the Spirit. God's glory should be our highest goal in life. But for those of you who are not Christians, this is for you. Those of you who are blind in your sin, you must be born again. I speak to you here in this room. I speak to those who may see this on the internet. You know if you haven't entrusted yourself to Christ, you must be born of the Spirit as Christ taught to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I beg you do not think poorly of God. If, even if you say, well, I, I don't know the Lord, I, I, who is he? Don't look at him that way. He made the escape for you. You say, ah, oh, look at the troubles of my life. Don't do it that way, folks. Look what he did to save you from those things. Those are there to show you that this world is cursed because of our sin. That's why we have pain and difficulty. It's a reminder, something's wrong. He has shown you the truth that he cares for you by dying on the cross before you were even born physically. Christ has already come. He's already made the sacrifice. He's already satisfied the Father, but you must take Jesus to yourself. You must call upon him. You must repent of your sin and place your faith in Christ, in his life. So that when you stand in the throne room, you stand in the robes of another and not in the rags of your own sin. Let me encourage you who think, well, there can be no grace for me. I've done too many horrible things. Sometimes people do that. They make that be the excuse. So they do not come. Consider that when Christ was on the cross, taking that very punishment, there were two others, thieves, hanging on the crosses on either side of him for crimes. Just like you will be if you don't trust God. But in the beginning, these two men were both railing against Christ. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. They were both saying this. But later, we read there was a change of heart in one of those two thieves. This is from Luke 23. And one of the criminals hanging there was blaspheming, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God? since you were under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now he said that he was hanging on a cross. He could do no work at all. He could not pay for his sins in one way, one whit, not an iota. There was nothing he could do. But he comes to Christ in mercy. The Lord said to Bartimaeus, Lord, what would you like me to do for you? Lord, that I might see. This man says, remember me. And Jesus says, today I say to you, you shall be with me in paradise. Think on this. This man could do nothing. Literally clung to, to his life. He rebukes the other thief. He turns to Christ. His disposition is suddenly changing. You see that? Wretched soul that he was, he asks Christ to remember him. It's outlandish. He has nothing to recommend him. How does he know that Christ wouldn't say, curse you? He knows because he's been made alive. He knows because he trusts. Jesus sees his faith in that moment. And he can see your faith too. Come to Christ. Call upon him. Amen.